Misrepresentation. In this podcast, I will talk to you about the law of misrepresentation. This is the situation in which a false statement of fact induces a party to enter into a contract. Misrepresentation comes in a number of forms, not all of which are intentional. There is the perhaps classic example of fraudulent misrepresentation, which you might link with deception or lying. There is negligent misrepresentation and innocent misrepresentation. I will talk through each of these in turn. Fraudulent misrepresentation is what you might consider lying, and really it is the tort of deceit. A speaker makes a fraudulent misrepresentation if he makes a false statement, knowingly, without belief in its truth, or reckless as to whether it is true or not. This came from the case of Derry and Peake in 1889. Honest belief that the statement is true is a complete defence to a claim of fraudulent misrepresentation, although the defendant may still be open to a claim of negligent misrepresentation if, while believing the statement was true, they were reckless or careless in their actions. The second type of misrepresentation is negligent misrepresentation, and there are two forms of it. There is common law negligent misrepresentation and statutory misrepresentation under the Misrepresentation Act of 1967. There are major differences between these two forms. The first difference is in terms of who can bring a claim for misrepresentation. Common law negligent misrepresentation can be brought by anyone, not just a party to a contract. Statutory negligent misrepresentation can only be made out by a party to the contract. The second major difference is in the burden of proof. Under common law, the onus is on the claimant to prove that the spoken or the misrepresentative statement was false. Under statute, under the Misrepresentation Act of 1967, the burden is on the person who made the statement to prove that he believed the statement was true and that there were reasonable grounds for this belief. Because of this reversal of the burden of proof, a party to a contract is likely to find a claim of negligent misrepresentation on a statutory basis far more appealing because it throws the burden of proof over to the defendant to prove that he believed the statement was true and that this was reasonable. I would suggest that you take a look at two cases, Hedley Byrne and Heller, and Esso Petroleum and Marden, and also look through the Misrepresentation Act of 1967 and see the statutory basis for negligent misrepresentation for yourself. The third type of misrepresentation is innocent misrepresentation, and this is probably best summed up as the situation in which someone who, despite making a false statement, is able to to avail themselves of the defence under the Misrepresentation Act of 67, that although the statement they made was in fact false, they believed that it was true, and that there were reasonable grounds for that belief. It does not mean that what they said was correct, but it does mean that no culpability under the law of misrepresentation attaches to their false statement. Misrepresentation is the situation in which a false statement of fact induces a party to enter into a contract, and, as I've just discussed, it comes in a number of different forms, fraudulent negligent and innocent misrepresentation in the case of an honest and diligent but incorrect speaker. To prove misrepresentation, you need to prove both elements of the offence, the false statement of fact and that the false statement induced a party to enter into a contract. Generally speaking, for a statement of fact to be subject to a claim of misrepresentation, it has to be a statement of current or past rather than future fact. It has to be a statement of fact, not prediction. Statements which are mere predictions, i.e. refer to the future, provided there is no dishonesty or recklessness involved, are not misrepresentations even if they are wrong. This comes from the case of entrepreneur Pubco and Sweeney. However, Where a party makes a statement in a reckless manner, or worse, in a fraudulent manner, knowing it will be false, 
Such a statement could potentially be actionable as fraudulent misrepresentation, notwithstanding that it is a prediction or a, or a future statement. See the case of Crystal Palace Football Club and Ian Dowie. Thus, if I were to say I will be travelling to Africa next January, and that is my genuinely held intention, it would not be misrepresentation even if, in fact, I end up not going. If, however, I know full well that I will not be going to Africa in January, and still make the statement, if I induce someone en to enter into a contract on that basis, my statement would likely be fraudulent misrepresentation, even though it relates to a future event. In a similar vein, a statement of opinion is unlikely to be misrepresentation. Bissett and Wilkinson. For example, if I opine that a second-hand car looks good for driving off-road, and in fact it turns out to be terrible, you cannot sue me for misrepresentation. As an exception to this general rule, if I have a particular or special skill or knowledge in the area, my opinion may be considered to contain within it an implied statement of fact, see Smith and Landhouse. If I were, for example, an acknowledged off-road driving expert, and I opined that a particular car would be good at driving off-road, you might look to make the argument that, as an expert and in voicing a view on the subject, I was aware of the car's recorded off-road performance and so misstated fact, rather than just opinion. Lastly, statements of law were not, at least traditionally, considered statements of fact. If anything, they were closer to statements of opinion, as, as a general principle, everyone is taken to know the law. This seems to be a very questionable policy, um, relying on the opinion of the average man on the street when it comes to the law governing, say, electronic money, might be unwise, and indeed they might have an opinion, but nothing more. However, if you ask for the opinion of a leading lawyer in the area, it seems rather different, and the position now indeed appears to be that the principle no longer applies and that false statements of law can be actionable as misrepresentation. See the Pankinea case. So if you can be liable for misrepresentation for what you say, is silence the better option? Clearly, knowingly making a false statement falls within the category of false misrepresentation, uh, fraudulent misrepresentation rather, if it induces a party to enter into a contract. But what if the party is silent? Can one make a statement through silence? Generally speaking, no, since it's not a misrepresentation. There is generally no positive duty to make a statement which might influence someone. Hans and Simpson Fawcett. There are exceptions to this general principle, including the particular situation of insurance, where there is a principle of what is known as uberimai fide, or utmost good faith. It is incumbent on someone seeking insurance to raise all pertinent matters to the insurer even if the insurer does not ask specifically for them, see Lambert and Cooperative Insurance. If the omission had an effect, even if it is not a decisive factor on the part of the insurer, the omission by silence is likely to amount to actionable misrepresentation, Pan-Atlantic Insurance and Pine Top Insurance. The general principle that silence is not misrepresentation applies to, well, silence. And silence is the absolute absence of communication. Winking or shaking the head or smiling may not be verbal, but can as easily be misrepresentation as something vocal. See Walkers and Morgan. Consider, for example, the situation in which you ask a garage whether a car has had a safety check in the last year, and the seller nods her head. She might not have said anything, but she would be clearly misrepresenting the position if she nodded her head knowing that the car had had no safety check. Similarly, just as conduct can amount to acceptance, conduct can amount to misrepresentation. Intentionally hiding defects in a property's structure, for example, is likely to amount to a fraudulent misrepresentation of the status of the property, see Gordon and Seleco. Similarly, inducing someone to enter into a contract to sponsor tour arrangements for a group who were appeared together in publicity shots despite knowing that, unannounced, one member of the group was going to leave, was also misrepresentation. See the Spice Girls case. 
The first of the two tests of misrepresentation, therefore, is that there must be a false statement of fact. The second aspect of the test of misrepresentation is that the statement must induce a party to enter into a contract. There are two aspects to this limb of the test. The first is that the statement must be intended to be acted upon. And the second is the statement must be the actual inducement, even if not the sole inducing factor. So we say that the statement must be intended to be acted upon. In the case of Peake and Gurney, it was held that a share purchase prospectus issued to the public for the purpose of buying newly issued shares in a company could not be relied upon by someone who sought to buy shares after the offering had been completed. The prospectus may have been wrong, in fact, but it was only actionable by those to whom it was addressed and not to the world at large. You might compare this with the case of Caparo and Dickman, in which it was held that auditors were not responsible for an error in their work on which Caparo relied, since they knew neither of Caparo nor that someone would rely on the work for the purpose which Caparo did. Second, the statement must be the actual inducement, although not the sole inducing factor. What this means is that it must be the statement which induces the party to enter into a contract. If the party relies not on the statement but on their own opinion of the situation, for example, there is no claim of misrepresentation. See the case of Atwood and Small. Similarly, if a party is not aware of something at the time at which they enter into a contract, they cannot claim that they were induced by it, Horsfall and Thomas. However, provided that the false statement did induce the party to enter into a contract, it need not be the only reason the party did so, Edgington and Fitzmorris. So if you can prove that there was a false statement of fact and that it did induce you to enter into a contract, what is your remedy? Misrepresentation makes a contract voidable at the request of the reliant party. As such, the contract is treated as rescinded, and the parties are put back into the position which they would have been in if there had been no contract. Although a party may claim damages for fraudulent or negligent misrepresentation, innocent misrepresentation is usually remedied by rescission only. A claim for damages under the Fraudulent misrepresentation is fundamentally a claim under the law of tort for deceit, and the general position for tortious damages is to restore the status quo, to put the parties back into the position they would have been in had the tort not happened. As such, costs incurred by the claimant as a result of the misrepresentation are recoverable, and because of the deceptive nature of the tort, the limitation around foreseeability of damages does not apply in the case of fraudulent misrepresentation, the case Doyle and Olby. A claim for damages for negligent misrepresentation is subject to the rule on reasonable foreseeability. Damage which could not be reasonably foreseen is too remote to be recoverable. Hedley Byrne and Heller. To sum up, Misrepresentation is the situation in which a party makes a false statement which induces another party to enter into a contract. Where the false statement is made knowingly or recklessly, the misrepresentation is said to be fraudulent, where a party should have made more care in making their statement, but was not fraudulent, the statement might be negligent misrepresentation and where a party genuinely believes that their statement is true and it's reasonable for them to believe that, but they are still wrong, their misrepresentation is innocent. As a rule of thumb, only current and past situations are capable of being misrepresented, with future events being treated as predictions, although a knowingly misleading statement about a future event may still be fraudulent misrepresentation. Statements of opinion of the average person are not misrepresentations. A statement of law is now considered capable of being a subject of misrepresentation, perhaps especially where the speaker is known to have some knowledge in the area, although the opinion of the average person on the legal position of something is unlikely to be a misrepresentation. If the statement induces someone to enter into a contract, even if they have other reasons for doing so, it is actionable. But if the party does not rely on the statement at all, or does not know about it, 
it cannot be misrepresentation.